in the hopes that they will win at least 11 times. Anyway, it's good to be here to enjoy this week before Thanksgiving and to look at this text, which is Philippians 4. Beginning with the fourth verse, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about everything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want to read the next verse as well. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, focus on these things. What is interesting about that verse is that every single one of those words, true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, appear nowhere else in the New Testament. They're not Koine Greek words, they're classical Greek words. Paul's way of saying, affirm everything in the world that is lovely and good. I have five things in this. If it helps you, I will tell you. Um, life becomes thanksgiving when we realize salvation, point number one. Life becomes thanksgiving when we become people of prayer. Life becomes thanksgiving when there is a celebration of praise. Life becomes thanksgiving when we approach it with confidence. Life becomes thanksgiving when we offer it as a dedication. Heavenly Father, we enter this place with a spirit of praise and gratitude, with expectancy that you will speak to us, with the tremendous awareness of what this hour means in our life. We find in it the resources we need to live life with excellence. We find within it guidance, assurance of salvation. Lord, it's so good to be here. Please guide us as we reflect on your word. And as we share together a unique week, we will be with family and friends. It will be a week of celebration. Lord, bless it. Keep us safe. Use it for our spiritual enrichment. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I love peanuts. A couple of years ago, there appeared a classic in Schultz cartoon characters the week before Thanksgiving. Lucy's feeling very sorry for herself, and she laments. My life is a drag. I'm completely fed up. I've never felt so low in all my life. Linus tries to control her, her little brother. Lucy, when you're, in a, when you're in a mood like this, you should try to think of things you have to be thankful for. In other words, count your blessings. To that, Lucy says, ha. Huh, that's a good one. I could count my blessings on one finger. I've never had anything, and I never will have anything. I don't get half the breaks other people do. Nothing ever goes right for me. You talk about counting your blessings. You talk about being thankful. What do I have to be thankful for? Linus says, well... For one thing, you have a little brother who loves you. And Lucy runs and hugs Linus, and she's crying tears of joy. 
And while she's hugging him tightly, Lina says, every now and then I say the right thing. <laughs> Indeed, sometimes to say the right thing is not easy. Thanksgiving time. So many texts, texts we've preached on, thought about, to say the right thing in a world that's loaded with grumbling and complaint, adversity and confusion, to say the right thing. A wonderful story out of a monastery where the brothers had all taken a vow of absolute silence, part of their discipline. However, Every five years, they were allowed to speak two words to the abbot. A new monk came into that monastery, and at the end of five years, he went to the abbot's office. He sat down, and he looked at the abbot and said, Food bad. He left, waited five years, and came back and said, Bed hard. He went away and came back five years later and said, I quit. And the abbot said, well, I'm not surprised. All you ever do is complain. <laughs> People complain. The wife was trying to please her husband. Got up to fix his breakfast and said, what would you like? He said, two eggs, one fried and one scrambled. She fixes it, puts it before him. He looks at it and says, you did it again. You fried the wrong one. <laughs> People born in the objective case. That's what Paul is doing in Philippians especially. He, he uses a major text to assert all these truths against the stinging realities of the world we live in. Now let me take a moment just to review all the texts that are in the lectionary list this week. Just let me review them for a moment. One of them is Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. And here's what it says. Moses said, speaking for God, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you out of the land of oppression. I've given you a new land flowing with milk and honey. I've given you wonderful new possibilities. And now, bring the first fruits of your harvest before the Lord. And he says in verse 2, he says, Offer a gift at the place the Lord has chosen as a dwelling place in his name. Offer a gift that the Lord has chosen as a dwelling place in His name. You've been blessed. Offer a gift in this place. Offer a gift in life. The psalm that connects with this is Psalm 100. A lot of you know it by heart. I learned it in the second grade. Make joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. It's a beautiful song. Know ye the Lord that He is God. It is He that is made of and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, into His courts with praise. His truth endureth forever. Serve the Lord with gladness. Enter Enter any place in life, your home, your workplace, and especially the place you worship. Enter with exultant joy and offer thanksgiving and affirm our need to serve wherever we are. The gospel text follows the feeding of the 5,000. Great miracle. Everyone was transfixed on that. They were impressed. Jesus could feed 5,000 people, and they were following him for the byproducts of Christianity. And Jesus turns their attention away from the bread, the manna that was fed to them in the wilderness, and the bread they received at the miracle, and says to them, I want to talk to you about the bread of life. I am the bread of life. 
He talks about the spiritual bread that will ultimately become available when his body is offered on a cross and his blood is shed for our sins. And he says that this is the bread which came down out of heaven I'm talking about. Not as our fathers ate and died. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. It's a beautiful collection of texts. And Paul, in this marvelous epistle of joy, is speaking to his favorite church, who had been faithful in their stewardship. When he thought about them, he was thankful to remember them. And he says to them, rejoice in the Lord always. And unless you forget, I want to tell you again, rejoice. He says, let your gentleness, it's an interesting word, let your triumphant fortitude, let your patience in adversity, let whatever comes down the pike that God sends your way, you take it and find a way in it to honor God, whether it's good or whether it's bad. You turn difficult circumstances into an occasion for joy. Paul was in jail. What's he saying? Let your life be an expression of thanksgiving. And he says, this is the secret to it. In everything. In everything by prayer, you're connected with God and supplication. Whatever you pour out of your heart, talk to God honestly. In prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. Do it with thanksgiving. And he says, that opens up the avenue of peace. Unruffled feeling in your heart of calmness, of trust in God. Prayer becomes the avenue by which you realize peace. And then everything in the world, you can put it in proper perspective. You will be able to see life as it really is. So Paul is doing a beautiful job of affirming all that thanksgiving means. So quickly this. Your life is thanksgiving when you realize your salvation. When you realize God has delivered you, He's brought you out of a bad land of Egypt, gave you a promised land flowing with milk and honey. Thanksgiving, we celebrate the birth of our country. We celebrate our new birth. We celebrate our salvation. That's what the writer of Deuteronomy and Paul is trying to say. But you begin with the fact that God has snatched you out of a terrible peril and gave you new possibilities. So in the second verse, the second chapter, he's talking about people who grumble. He said, but God called you as shining lights. And he says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. That is the outworking of what God has done inside of you shows itself in the world. It's not being super pious. It's not being in anybody's face. It isn't to buttonhole anybody. It's to live your life as an expression that salvation is real. He said it in Ephesians, by grace have you been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of your works, lest anyone should boast. Then he said, we are his workmanship. We're his poems. We're his poems. When grace happens in your life, the rhyme and the reason and the poetic beauty of who you are in Christ begins to reflect itself in the world around you. By the way, you know what the Greek word is for Thanksgiving? I've told you many times. Eucharist. We use it in connection with the Lord's Supper. All it means is good grace. It's two Greek words that mean good grace. Grace. God has good graced you. So really, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, salvation is this bread and this cup are symbols 
of salvation. We affirm that every time we have the Lord's Supper. The second thing is, life becomes a thanksgiving when we become people of prayer. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, leads to peace. So when you've embraced that, you've entered into that spirit of being connected with God and honest with God in your supplication, it results in a wonderful thing called peace. Isn't that a great way to live? Look, you're going to live with uh, triumphant fortitude or sweet reasonableness. You're going to live with that thing Paul is talking about when you have peace in your heart, when it's uncluttered with all that stuff. When things happen, you can either get bitter or you can get better. And he says, this peace is perpetual. Nothing can enter your heart and disturb it. It is like a military battalion at your heart's door holding out any enemy that will rob you of the good things God wants to give you. Now just put your finger in that place. When we become people of prayer, ah, oh, you hear that. We, we say that a lot. You say that to me. We have some guests in here. Last Sunday goes back long years in my life. My first church out of seminary, they were young people in that church. They walk out the door and say, here's a name I want you to put on the prayer list. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. The third thing is remember that life is Thanksgiving when there's a celebration of praise in your life, in your home, in your church. Enter into the gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. I did a 100-page paper on these three verses in seminary. All the Greek words, all the verb tenses, but a section of that paper had to do with the history of the text. And if you could uh, relate it to the church fathers or early places in church history where that text was important, I, I was a good mark in that paper. And the only thing I want to quote out of that paper is a quote from Ignatius in the year 100. And here's what he said about worship. Listen. It's a meeting of thanksgiving in which the congregation, assured of salvation, all of you assembled here, assured of salvation, with one spirit sings praise to God as one vast choir. Assured of salvation, we echo in this place celebration. The most important thing here is to convey to you the beauty of what God has done to secure for you eternal hope. Now look, it needs to happen wherever we go in life. In 1997, at the Academy Awards, an Italian actor, for the first time ever, an Italian actor was up for the Academy Award. Robert Benigni. Benigni played in a film called Life is Beautiful. He played Guido. Guido was the father who protected his son in a Nazi concentration camp from all the brutality and in the most adverse circumstances helped that child find joy. Everybody loved that movie. Hollywood loved it. And so on the night of that Academy Award for the first time, an Italian actor received the Academy Award. And Robert literally ran, danced down the aisle, leaped over a chair, charged onto the stage and grabbed Sophia Loren, who was presenting that award, and literally hugged her and squeezed her, which I think is an altogether, altogether great idea, really. <laughs> and then, and, and these are the words he spoke. He said, he said as he responded to this lovely moment, 
his words where I would like to kiss every one of you and die in a notion of generosity. Now, he was known for being a bit excited about everything. In fact, when he met the Pope, he hugged the Pope and called him Daddy. And the Pope said, that's very Italian. The next year, when he was to offer the Best Actress Award, I forgot that guy's name again that presents those at the Academy Award, played in City Slickers. Billy Crystal, thank you. Billy Crystal stood behind him with a net to restrain him. And then many said this, it is a sign of mediocrity when you demonstrate your gratitude with moderation. I read Psalm 22 recently and saw something in it I had never seen. It was a messianic psalm. It starts out with Jesus' cry from the cross, eventual cry from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the moment when Jesus enters that dark abyss torn by affliction, by forsakenness. And he cries in the words that shattered the ears of the angels. It was a moment that drained hell of all of its horror shattered our night of gloom. It was a pivotal moment. And do you know what the next verse is in Psalm 22? The Lord inhabits the praises of Israel. What that says to me this morning is when you're aware of the phenomenal thing God has done to deter you away from that awful plight, it is a moment of exalted praise. God inhabits that moment of praise. Number four, life becomes thanksgiving when we approach it with confidence. Read all of Philippians 4. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The peace of God that passes all understanding that you can't explain will keep out everything to harm you. Here's how the writer of Hebrews says it. Listen to this. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks and offer acceptable worship kingdom that cannot be shaken in a world that's crumbling in a world that scares us you face the realization of a kingdom that cannot be shaken listen I've seen people face life with that kind of confidence in her memory 97 years old in hospice, 18 months. Never spoke a word of complaint. Knew that any day she was leaving. Nothing but confidence. Absolute, total confidence. What's well, a great way to live? You should pray that God would fortify your heart with that unshakable confidence. Finally, life becomes thanksgiving when you offer it in dedication. All of those texts tell us to offer our lives, to offer gifts, to make our life an expression of what God has done for us. Psalm 116, I will pay my vows in the presence of all God's people. I will be your servant. I love Western movies. We only have one TV in our house where you can go to those channels, upward channels, where you can get the Western channel. Miriam and I have to bargain occasionally because I love those Western movies. I love those old 30-minute segments of Gunsmoke. Way back when I was a little boy, that came on TV on Sunday night. 
Everybody was ready to get out of church on Sunday night to get home and watch gun smoke. Preachers preached a lot against gun smoke. I saw an episode the other day where Chester's in the long branch with Marshall Dillon. Chester says, Marshall Dillon, this coffee is awfully black. And he proceeds to put 10 spoonfuls of sugar in the coffee. And Matt Dillon said, Chester, that won't make it any whiter. He said, yeah, but Marshall Dillon, it sure will make it sweeter. There's one line you hear in Western movies I want to leave with you. In fact, I saw it in a Long Ranger episode. Somebody robbed the bank, took all the money, and the Long Ranger catches them. Gets all the money back and takes it to the mayor. Returns all the people's money. And the mayor looks at and says to the Long Ranger, Much obliged, masked man. Much obliged, masked man. I'm much obligated. That's what Thanksgiving is. It's the habitual recognition of a great obligation. Now, Paul said the secret is prayer. And he said in life, we are to offer a gift in the place where God has chosen as his dwelling. So next Sunday, we vote on a budget. Everybody's discussed it. It's a scientific process. You measure what you spent last year, what you anticipate this year. You go through a process and come up with a proper number, and it's done right and it's done well. We'll come in here and vote on that budget and affirm it. It has to do with tithing. And you know that I don't ever say a whole lot about that on the pulpit, probably to your detriment and an unfortunate thing. But here's what I want to remind you today that in 2014, we have to address some specific needs in these wonderful facilities God has given to us. We are situated in one of the most beautiful spots on the earth. The village area of St. Simon's is a magnet. People love it. There are four churches right here in this close vicinity. People flow through here, and we have wonderful opportunities. We've been here for 75 years. If you could do the math on what you believe all these facilities would be valued at. Take the real estate from the Mission House all the way down to this corner, cross this street, go all the way to Grammar School and all the way to Ocean Boulevard, draw a big circle around it, all these acres, all these buildings. Been here in a process for 75 years. And a whole lot of people have done a lot to make all this possible. They have given sacrificially. Some of you have been here a long time. Through all these years, you've done much. Not in 17 years have we really addressed all these maintenance needs, nor the aesthetic needs of the sanctuary. In everything by prayer, this is my word to you, to connect that with 2014 because soon after the starting of the year, we're going to make you aware of how you can enter into making a change and helping us realize some goals that need to be realized. I've been going through this process anticipating myself what I can do in 2014 to make a gift to these facility needs. We have a roof in the back area that absolutely must have repair. Cannot be delayed very long, has to have repair. This is a beautiful building. There's a quaint beauty about it. It's been here a long time. It needs some aesthetic improvements. Pews need to be refinished. We need to address pew cushions. We need to address some areas in the sanctuary to make it even more beautiful than it is. This Thanksgiving, reflect on all that God has done in this place. Both of my children were baptized here. For some of you who don't know, I was here when I was a kid. 
long time ago. Both of my children were baptized together. I have seen good things through all the years because this place has been here. What you can do over these Thanksgiving holidays is sincerely pray about what it is you think God might want you to do in an over and above gift, committed over several years, and look, this is in-house, reasonable, no pressure opportunity for you to do something that will bless God's kingdom and bless your life. So on this um, Sunday before Thanksgiving, I, I wanted to remind you that one of the greatest expressions of your life is to offer the gift that makes everything that we do here be done better. And I trust that God will bless us as we do it. We are thankful, O oh Lord, for this day, for the week before us, for the unfolding year that will come when we can continue to serve you and do it better, be more conscious of sharing the gospel with people who need it to improve everything that we do, to make your house better. We ask you today to be at work in our hearts to remind us of how we can respond in ways that honor you. Speak to my heart, speak to the hearts of all of us, that we can serve the Lord with gladness and joy that our life will become an expression of the gratitude of what you've done for us. You call us, Lord, to a beautiful place to serve you. We ask today you would just do something in our lives and hearts that will cause us to do that with greater excellence and greater commitment and greater sacrifice. Thank you for saving us and giving us eternal hope and for the privilege to share that with many others in ways that change their lives. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.